RJ Scarange is CEO of EV manufacturer Rivian, and Hassan Jamil is deputy president of Abdul Latif Jamil. RJ and Hassan have a long standing relationship cultivated through years of collaboration. When they first met through their networks at MIT, they formed an immediate connection. The pivotal moment was in 2012, when the global investment arm of the Jamil family, known as Jimco, became the primary investor in Rivian. It is great to be joined by RJ and Hassan today to discuss their remarkable journey, the future of mobility, and the exciting potential for EVs in Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Thank you. Now, I'd like to know about the future of EVs on a global scale, and I'd like to know about the future of EVs here in the kingdom. RJ, give us the global outlook, if you would. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable, um, you know, being here in Saudi Arabia talking about electrification and talking about really the scale and the speed at which this transition is happening. And, you know, I started Rivian 14 years ago, and I can remember the early discussions we would have with investors, with other folks around the auto industry. And at that point, the idea of electrification was sort of this small subset of transportation. Um, and to just think that you know, over the last decade, it's gone from sort of the view of it as a small subset to recognizing that over the course of the next decade or two, this will make up the vast majority, if not all, of vehicle production across the world. And we see it through the lens of our supply base, we see it through the lens of policymakers, and, but it, most importantly, we're seeing it through the lens of customer demand. And even customers today that, that aren't buying an electric vehicle, they're, for, for I'd say, the first time recognizing that this internal combustion vehicle may be their last or second to last. And they're even thinking, when is my last internal combustion vehicle purchase? And so we see just a massive shift and a tremendous level of excitement around the products to come, what, what's, what's that to bring in terms of new features, new capabilities. Uh, so it's, it's, I'd say, one of the most exciting times one can imagine in the transportation space right now. I'm in that place. Who else is in that place where they're contemplating making the move to an EV? How many people in this room? And how many people are already driving an EV in this room? We could say roughly 20% are driving EVs. No surprise, Hassan and RJ are driving EVs. Hassan, share with us your forecast for the Saudi market in particular, if you would. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for, for you being here. And, and it's really an honor for me, and it's really wonderful to be a part of the FII. Um, you know, we're seeing so much. I think the common theme, you know, that I'm hearing more and more here in FII is everyone's energized, everyone's so excited in their respective industries. And it's no different in the automotive industry as well. You know, today, if you look at Saudi Arabia, we're coming, we're talking about a market today that is um, coming close to one million units per year. Um, now, one million units per year for, for any, one million units of new cars sold per year. Um, for any manufacturer around the world, for any, you know, company that's involved in automotive, when you say I'm a million cars a year, the spotlight's on you. And Saudi Arabia is, is coming very close to that. Before 2030, the forecast is that it will hit a million new cars per year. Now, of course, you know, the Saudi population is a very young population. The Saudi population is very educated. They're very connected. In our recent uh, survey, a YouGov survey we did, we found out that 70%, over 70% of Saudis think about sustainability when they buy their car. Uh, and that's a very big number. So, so it just shows you how well in tuned are there in understanding what's happening in the future. You know, we know today, and I'm sure many of you have heard that you know companies like Lucid, companies like Sear have started localization here. Sear, which is a, um, a local company that the PIF and some other companies started. I actually bought uh, a Lucid, and I'm so happy. Thank you, PIF. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful car, even though I'm a Toyota salesman by heart. But, but I bought a Lucid, and I, and I absolutely love it. There are companies also in Saudi Arabia that have been announced that are starting the EV infrastructure um, to build EV uh, infrastructure around all the country. Um, you know, they announced that Riyadh will be 30% electrified by 2030. Now, that's a big number, and it's a very... Um, it's a very achievable number, I believe. So you have, you know, you have supply and you have demand. You know, you have your young, hungry 
um, progressive, um, progressive Saudis, and you have, you know, on the other side, a lot happening in the EV space. So I think there's a lot of potential and it's a very exciting time to be in Saudi Arabia. So the young Saudi population really pushing EV sales in the kingdom now and hopefully into the future as their incomes allow them to purchase newer and nicer cars. Absolutely. And you both knew so many years ago, even before we really started talking about EVs in the mainstream, that there would be such huge demand based both on the environmental aspects and the volatile costs of fuel. So when you think back on those moments, recollect for us, if you would, the real origins of your shared passion for EVs and for sustainability. RJ. Yes, yeah, so I, I grew up a, a massive car enthusiast and uh, worked on cars. Uh, if you were to go into my bedroom when I was a 10-year-old, you'd find car parts and windshields and uh, grew up just engulfed in, in everything automotive. And as I, as I got older, I realized that these things I loved so much were at the root of so many of our, of our challenges as society. So everything from climate change to uh, local air quality in essentially every major city around the world to a lot of the geopolitical challenges we've had across the planet. And um, decided I wanted to work on that and do something and start a car company, whatever that might have meant to a 12-year-old. You know, but then began designing sort of my path to say I want to go start this company and starting to educate myself on what that meant. And um, I used to tell my parents when I was a kid, I'd be, I, I would say, boy, I wish I was born in like 1870 because then I could have been there at the beginning of the auto industry. <laughs> and I look at where things are today and I'm so happy I'm alive at this point because I think the transition we're going through in the scale uh, is even more exciting than going from a horse to a car. Uh, the, the scale of taking a global fleet of one and a half billion combustion-powered vehicles and transitioning those to electric, uh, taking a grid infrastructure uh, that's built largely on fossil fuels and converting that to renewables, um, and then, of course, connecting the vehicle and, and seeing more and more uh, self-driving and AI make their way into the vehicle. It's just such a remarkable time. So that was sort of all fed into uh, my decision to start the company, and fortunately, uh, you know, as, as shortly after starting the company, I met Hassan and met the, the Jamil family, and they've been such a critical part of the journey and, and such an amazing part of the journey. And um, So it, it's sort of interesting our paths, uh, paths combined on this. And also, I mean, you realize your childhood dreams as a pioneer in the EV industry. So how remarkable is that? Hassan, from where does your really passion for this stem? So I consider myself a third generation car salesman. So my grandfather, my father and myself, we've, for the last 70 years, almost 70 years, we've been in the automotive space. You know, as a young boy, I was always, um, you know, with my father and my grandfather on the sales floor, you know, watching, seeing. I spent quite a long time in Japan, you know, studying there and also working for Toyota on the production line, understanding what Toyota Way meant, Kaizen, the value chain in, in the automotive industry. So, so that was kind of my, my, my experience in automotive. I tell people, if you open me up, Toyota comes out. You know, it's, it's just everything I, I do what did was Toyota. So a big passion for Toyota. As a family, we've always been interested in impact investing. Um, and of course, EV is a big part of that. Um, so, you know, that's when I met RJ. And I think, you know, one thing him and I have in common is we love adventure. Um, you know, we, we did crazy things in our life, and, and maybe one of the things we did was we climbed, I didn't want to mention this, but we climbed one of the largest flagpoles in, in the world, which was in Jeddah. You know, we climbed it together. So we both have an adventurous spirit, and I think that really reflected, you know, what Rivian is today, at least from my, my eyes, you know, I, we had that in common. Well, when we look at the numbers, the IEA says 10 million EVs were sold globally last year, and it anticipates this year, the world will see 14 million EV sales. So RJ probably made the right decision when you ventured into the EV industry. Looking back, besides your childhood dreams, what really pushed you to enter the EV industry? Um, yeah, I mean, when you think about the scale of the challenge in front of us, I think often um, we wrongly look at electrification and, and the, the tasks in front of us as an industry, 
and think of it as if one company or two companies can solve it, whether it be energy or grid or vehicle. And, and the scale is just uh, almost overwhelmingly large. So globally, we build anywhere from 80 to 90 million vehicles a year as an industry. As I said, the, the, the existing car park is around one and a half billion vehicles. And we have to, as, as an industry and a society, create a, a wide range of different options for consumers. So different form factors, different price points, different brand positions. And, um, you know, in, in thinking about Rivian, we wanted to go out and actively drive that. And we think about impact both through the lens of the products we create, uh, but importantly, also through the products that we can help inspire. When I say inspire, inspire through competition, inspire through shifting mindsets. And a big part of how we defined our strategy was we wanted to, to launch the brand, launch our company with a set of products that really reset expectations in terms of what was possible. Um, so I remember in, in 2013, 2014, I'd be talking about, we're gonna build an electric SUV or an electric truck. Uh, and the response would be some version of, well, can it drive over rocks? What if it gets wet? Will it short out? Um, and so we said, well, we're gonna make the most capable off-road vehicle in the world and simultaneously make it an incredible vehicle on road and simultaneously make it something you can live with every day. Uh, and that was how we designed the brand strategy and the product strategy to really reset expectations and, and help elevate how broadly consumers would think about electrification. And in the, in the process, we hoped we'd, we'd spur competition. We hoped there'd be other companies that say, hey, we need to accelerate our electrification plans. We need to create products to compete with, with Rivian's products. And in the end, the consumer benefits. The consumer benefits through choice, through lots of options. And we're still very early in this process. You said, you know, we did 10 million, and uh, we're going to do 10 million this year. We'll do 14, 15 million yet next year in terms of electric vehicles. But that still represents, call it 15% of huge global growth. demand. So there's huge growth opportunity and a huge need for more product to, to come into the space. Now, Rivian was founded in 2009, as I mentioned earlier, and Jimco has been its major investor since 2012. So, Hassan, you've really been working together for most of Rivian's existence. What was it that made Jimco invest in Rivian in those early days when the future was so uncertain? So, I always like to use reference this story. You know, when I took my, um, my nephew to university, the first time, you know, I asked him, in my days, when you go to university, your father gives, him, gives you his car, or he buys you a car, some, you know, some, any car, and I asked my nephew, I said, what car is, is your dad buying you? He said, oh, I don't want a car. I said, I said, why not? He said to me, well, you know, you have to talk to the salesman and negotiate, you have to find parking, you have to buy insurance, you have to, if you have a service, you have to take it for service, it's not clean, you know, it's sustainable, you know, so, so, I mean, it just, it occurred, and we, we realized this before, that in our industry, there's a lot of disruptions happen. And one of the major ones, you know, as RJ is, is mentioning, is, is the EV space. There's so much, you know, companies are looking at how they can use cleaner and sustainable ways to move forward. So that was one of the main reasons why we started, um, and we always wanted to look, we had a passion for manufacturing. And we looked for partners, we've always wanted to find partners. I met RJ, you know, to put things in perspective, when he was only 27 years old. He's a lot older now, uh, <laughs> but he was only 27. And we started talking and we started saying, you know, let's, let's build a car company together. Let's, you know, and he had, he's somebody who I met, who had, who, when I met him, had a macro, you know, understanding of what's the whole industry, but also very uniquely so, uh, a micro understanding of, you know, he'll tell you the nuts and the bolts of any single car. You tell him, what's this? He's like, he'll tell you, this is this kind of nut, this is this kind of screw, this is this kind of screw. Actually, the only thing he can do is if you ask him to draw a car, he can't actually draw a car, you know, <laughs> on a board. He's That's like, ironic. Oh, like, five-year-olds can draw a better car. But, but anyway, sorry, RJ, but, but anyway, my, my, my point is, you know, he understood what was happening. We, we believed we understood what was happening, and that's how the journey began in 2012. I met 2011, bring it to 2012, and here we are today. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for doing your part to preserve our planet and for sharing the story of your partnership and your friendship with us. Thank you, Arjun Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.